Welcome back to the Mount Man Medical YouTube channel. Thanks for hanging out. Today we're talking with Mr. Ryan Smith. He is in charge over at Spirit of the Blue, which is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to getting medical equipment to police officers who really, really need it. And uh, he has uh, taken some time today to talk to us a little bit about what he has going on and um, some of the things that they're doing and why it's so important for police officers to have trauma kits because it is extremely important. I, I tend to have a lot of friends in the law enforcement community. Medics and law enforcement tend to work pretty closely together. So we tend to have decent relationships with each other. So this is something that's pretty important to me. Um, I had a, uh, a, a very, very close friend of mine who died recently, who was a, uh, who was a cop and he was, he loved being a cop. So this is kind of my chance to love him, even though he's gone to help out a little bit, help his compatriots, his uh, brothers in arms, get the gear that they need. It's a pretty important deal for me. So, um, I'm going to talk to Mr. Mr. Smith here about uh, what he's go got going on over at Spirit of the Blue. And uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what is your organization? What do you guys do? Yeah, so Spirit of Blue Foundation has been in existence since 2011. It started with a line of duty death. Uh, our, our founder's older brother, Jeff Perola, was a main state trooper and was killed in the line of duty in 1994. And after doing a lot of stuff in the state of Maine, in 2011, they decided to take their foundation national uh, under the banner of Spirit of Blue. And what we've been doing ever since is exclusively safety equipment and training, just to make sure that officers are more safe. We, we find agencies that have a gap in funding, and we step in and make sure they have the things that they need. So since that time, we've done 152 grants into every state in the nation. And we have, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we have 14 saves credited to the equipment that we have That's delivered. Awesome. Very cool. And now, so why is it, why is it so important for police officers to have medical gear? What, what, what about that is, is important? Yeah. So, you know, the, the trend has been changing in policing in lots of different ways, and it's more informed by other events and things that have taken place around the world, most notably um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So when we talk about injuries and preventable death, one of the uh, the greatest determining factors there is speed to care and access to care. Mm -hmm. And um, any, any law enforcement officer knows, and it's important for your audience to know that um, if an officer is hurt in the line of duty on a call, um, EMS, paramedics, ambulances, don't just roll right up and start treating. They will hold, they'll stage you know, a safe distance away until the, the scene is clear and then they'll be released to go in and render that aid. Which could so, be hours if if it's like yeah. an active shooter situation or something crazy happening. That's absolutely true. So we start, the first level is self-care, right? An officer has to be able to render to himself or herself the care that they need um, no matter what situation they're in. So one of the big things that we advocate is that every officer in the United States needs to have as part of their uniform a tourniquet. And that's going to address about 25% of the injuries that they could sustain, right? It's not gonna fix everything. A head wound, you know, tourniquet's not gonna help. There's lots of other things that it's not gonna help, but 25% of the injuries that um, they're gonna be at risk of can be um, helped by the application of a tourniquet. So buddy or self-care is stage one, buddy care stage two, you're gonna have a partner, um, someone you're working with out on the scene and you need to be able to render care to them as well. Um, just like we talked about EMS staging, there was also an old school of thought that police don't transport for medical, right? Even if it's one of their own, if an officer goes down, you have to wait for the right people to get them. And you're seeing more and more a trend in the news now where officers don't wait. They'll throw someone in a patrol car. They'll, you know, commandeer someone's pickup truck and put the casualties in the bed and take them to the hospital themselves because the speed of getting to a trauma center outweighs the uh, the technical assistance or medical assistance that could be rendered on the way to the medical center, right? Especially if they've got that bleeding controlled with tourniquets. That's absolutely right. So, um, and then there's this whole secondary benefit. We as a foundation, we're all about officer safety. We want to see every officer come home safe at the end of every shift yes. to their family and to their lives. They deserve it and that's what should happen. However, when we place all of this equipment out into, um, out into the field, now it's available for these officers to use on members of the community because they have access to it 
and they're getting training on how to use it, which, you know, in large scale wasn't done before. You know, when I was a police officer, we went through CPR training and we were told the way that you render CPR now that you're trained is to get on the radio, call for EMS and wait for them to do it. It's not that way anymore. And I don't think any officer felt great about that either. But there was this sort of like there was sort of a belief structure that you're not prepared to handle this and you shouldn't handle this. But now, uh, you know, more and more officers, whether it's prior service military experience or they're taking the time to build these skills on their own or they have an agency that's providing them with medical training, they are equipped and they are confident and they want to help. And so they're, they're doing it. Excellent. Yes, I completely agree with that. I think that they deserve to have medical gear to get them home to their families. They're putting their lives on the line on a regular basis for each other and for us. Uh, I know so many cops and I also know firefighters, you know, who are also very brave, but there's a, there's a big difference in the types of culture. The firefighters will talk about it on a regular basis, how crazy cops are, you know, just to run into places and do things. Whereas firefighters are much more careful, you know, they set up and they follow chain of command. Whereas police officers are, there's someone that needs to be saved. They're running head first into that situation. They at least need a tourniquet to apply to themselves or keep a buddy from dying. I think that's very important. And that's so right. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times at the end of a call, when everyone gets back together and kind of reviews what happened, you know, people say, boy, I can't believe we just ran in and did all that. I didn't even think about it. You know, I just knew that that's what needed to get done. So I did it. But now that I'm looking at it, that could have gone either really wrong or that was one of the craziest things I've ever done. Yeah. It could have gone either way. And that's what's so yeah. cool about the job, you know, is that most people don't do that. And they, and cops have this culture of, they don't care. They're going in. Someone needs to be helped. They're there to do that job. And they get a lot of hate right now. And that's, that's, it's, it's a big bummer because not all cops are like that. Of course there's bad cops out there. There's bad medics out there. There's bad everybody out there, but so now why is it, uh, in, uh, why aren't all officers issued medical gear? Why is this even an, uh, a problem? Yeah, so it's definitely not for a lack of caring and it's not for a lack of the need. Um, it really comes down to when you hire a new officer, you have to have a uniform to put on them. You have to put them into a car. You know, they need to have a ballistic vest, although you'd be surprised in 2021, there's still agencies that don't issue ballistic vests to their officers. Mm -hmm or have a mandatory wear policy. So you start going down this list of priorities and at some point the money runs out, right? You know, they're going to be able to get this stuff, but not that stuff, right? So they're going to be able to issue um, a primary duty weapon, but they can't get a long gun for the car or they can get body armor, but they can't get a ballistic shield. And then you start just going down the list of priorities and um, either the money's gone before you get to medical equipment or there's an understanding of, we could afford the medical equipment. We don't have the training. So why would I give someone these tools if they don't know how to use it? In most cases, you're not going to mess it up. But um, but still, you know, there's there's liability at play and they want to make sure like if we're going to put the money towards this, we want to know that you can use it. One of the stories I tell, you know, because tourniquets is one of the biggest things that's changed in terms of policing. And that really is coming out of, you know, battlefield expertise in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, when I was a little Boy Scout, they said in first aid class, hey, there are things called tourniquets, but they're so dangerous. We're not even going to teach you how to make one yep. because you're going to hurt somebody. Yeah. When I got into the military, they really, you know, this was like 94. They really hadn't rolled them out much either. They taught us how to make them. They said, be really careful if you put one on, like only do it if you absolutely have to. But here's how you can do it. And they didn't give us one. And now in terms of, you know, both the military at standard issue and in policing, it's, you know, when in doubt, put one on because it's not going to do the damage that we thought it was going to do. It is going to help. And as long as you can get aid within four to six hours, you know, everything's going to be fine. And it's, it's, it's better to do it when in doubt. So there's a huge progression that has taken place for sure. Oh, definitely. And, and the only thing that's changing that is the amount of time and the amount of people that have already been hurt be because of those old ways of thinking. And that's a pretty right. common uh, misconception that I hear all the time. You know, if you apply a tourniquet there, a lot of people are convinced you're going to lose that leg. So if you want to save your arm, don't apply that tourniquet. And that's gotten a lot of people killed. So, you know, direct pressure, if you don't have a tourniquet, direct pressure is super important. And then if you do have a tourniquet, getting that applied as quickly as possible, you got to keep that blood in the body. That's 
yeah. very important. So what kind of medical gear do they need? Obviously tourniquets. Uh, what else do you think that they might uh, be able to use? Yeah, tourniquets is like what we grant the most in terms of medical equipment. And we've granted 4,400 so far. Wow. Uh, in addition to that, there are, you know, so IFAC is, is the more commonly term uh, that's used for military trauma kits, basic mm -hmm. military trauma kits. On the law enforcement side, we sometimes use that. Sometimes we use IPOC, an individual police officer kit. And it's pretty basic. It's a tourniquet, of course. It is um, uh, emergency dressing, combat gauze, or some type of a hemostatic agent to control blood loss. Sterile gloves may or may not have a, a pair of shears in it. And then usually they'll have a chest seal. And so you know, we talked about tourniquets uh, address 25% of the injuries that could occur. You know, if you get this more robust, it's still not huge, but you know, this bigger trauma kit, you can get upwards of the 50 percentile of injuries that you can at least address um, that could happen, you know, reasonably out on the street. And then if something more traumatic than that happens, typically an officer is not going to have the training to utilize the tools that are in that kit. Mm -hmm. And so um, it either takes, you know, someone who's medic trained, someone who's put in the extra time and is more familiar, or unfortunately it's stabilizing as much as you can and then waiting for a uh, rescue or medic to arrive. Yeah. Uh, that's something I did want to mention that if you ever come across an agency or a department or, you know, it's just an individual officer that's asking you, Hey, where can I get medical training? Uh, Mountain man medical. We, uh, we have a, uh, online training program it doesn't take too long it's a bunch of quick short videos that explains how to use all the various gear in it and you could sit some you know 20 people down in a class on some some in-service training day and have them all watch that and that might help it's not going to be as good as in-person training obviously you, you you definitely need to try to get that if at all possible but if a you know an organization doesn't have the resources to go out and purchase that that might be a uh a good resource for you. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now you'd said that you had, you had given out 4,400 tourniquets. Yep. Um, how many medical kits do you think that you've uh, put out so far? Uh, probably about 150. Uh, it's not requested as often where we tend to give them more. And we always give just tourniquets first, where we tend to also give the trauma kits is um, agencies that are located more rurally or geographically isolated. Right. Um, one great example is um, there's a tribal police department that's based out of Miami, Florida. Um, the name of the tribe is difficult for me to say. I kind of don't want to butcher it. I think it's Mikosuke, uh tribal police department based out of Miami, Florida. And they have, it's really interesting. Their jurisdiction is broken up into nine independent pockets that mm -hmm. don't touch, right? So they have a little pocket here and there's a big stretch of highway and then another pocket. Most of their medical response has to be done by helicopter because everything is so remote. Mm -hmm. And they came to us and said, listen, we, we are working traffic accidents like crazy. I shouldn't say accidents, collisions like crazy. And no one's there to render aid. We want to do that. We've got the training to do it, but we don't have access to the, the medical equipment. So would you get that for us? And so we, for them, in that particular case, we bought them more advanced uh, trauma kits to give them the you know additional tools that they need in order to be able to render aid because of their unique situation. Hmm. Um, we wouldn't be as inclined to do that in uh, like for say a really dense urban population uh, unless they had a really high violence rate. And then we, we may do that. Um, but one of the things that we're convinced of is it's always better to have the equipment on the person, on the officer than it is to have it in the car. And right. I remember I won't, I won't out them, but there was a sheriff's office that uh, we granted tourniquets to back in 2015, early in our time doing these grants. And um, at the press conference, I heard the, the sheriff say, oh, we're so happy we got these Pelican cases and the tourniquets are going to go in the cases and the cases are going to go in the trunks and they're ready to go at a moment's notice if it's needed. And, you know, I didn't want to say anything in front of the media, but I'm like, hold on a second, sir. This this is not where you want a tourniquet yeah. because all it takes is being on a foot pursuit and you're three blocks away from your car. You rip your leg open going over a fence or maybe you take a round and your tourniquet now is nowhere near where you need it. Right. Yeah. So you, you can run a long ways from your patrol vehicle chasing a bad guy. Right. And so what we find is trauma kits is one more tool that gets thrown into the trunk and either forgotten about or it's not where... It needs to be when the need is present. Uh, now, talking about trends and the way things are changing, if you've noticed, a lot of departments are moving away from concealable body armor underneath the shirt to overt carriers 
um, which go over the shirt right. and carry the ballistic panels. But because they're wearing that vest, they now have Molly and other attachment points. And so it's becoming very common for those officers and deputies to have a mounting point that they can put a small IFAC or IPOC on mm. so that their trauma kit is always with them. When we encounter agencies that are in that type of a configuration for their carry, we do kind of prioritize the trauma kit over just the tourniquet because they have the real estate in order to be able to carry it. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I uh, the video that I'm going to release on the YouTube channel this tomorrow um, is talking about a stabbing that happens at a gas station. And in that, I'm, I'm talking a lot about, you know, it's good that you have a trauma kit on you in your vehicle and everything but having one on your person is also really important and if you've got an officer that's running you know trying to chase down a bad guy a quarter mile away he's got to go a quarter mile back to pick up his trauma kit to run all the way back to help his buddy out who's bleeding the whole time it doesn't do him a whole lot of good that's right so now that's a kind of a question that uh, I had. You you said that you uh, you have different departments reach out to you asking you for help, and then it's it sounds like it's kind of a case by case basis about whether or not you can help or deciding who who to help more. What are some things that you don't do? I'm sure you get a lot of questions uh, asking you to do things, and what are some of the things that you uh, you kind of stay away from? Yeah, well, we talked about medical equipment. That's definitely in our wheelhouse. We do grant a lot of other things other than medical equipment. If there's something that will protect an officer on the job, keep them more safe, we will purchase that. So we do a lot of body armor, patrol rifles, flashlights, um, helmets, AEDs, riot shields, ballistic shields. Pretty much if it, if it will protect an officer, we'll do it. We get a lot of requests for radar trailers for some reason. Those are really hot for community safety. You know, people want, you know, officers and agencies want to see uh, people drive more sensibly on the street, and they do they do render a benefit, just not to the officer. So we don't purchase those. Um, we get a lot of requests for drones, and there is a safety component to drones. But sometimes when you read the uh, the applications, you can tell that there's a guy behind the keyboard who is just really excited about a thirty thousand dollar toy. <laughs> like, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna buy that for you. Um, especially if there's one that can be borrowed from a nearby jurisdiction or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a big trend around fitness equipment. You know, a lot of, a lot of agencies asked us to build them a gym and um, there's, there's definitely an officer safety component to fitness as well, but um, it comes down to, you can, you can build all the gyms you want, but if an officer doesn't want to go in there and actually put in the time to take care of himself and be prepared, then it's wasted money. So, we look for things that are definitely going to be in the right place at the right time where there is the greatest need. And that's where we try and invest our money. I love it. I think you guys are doing amazing stuff. I think uh, our boys in blue definitely need you and the rest of the community that appreciates them to kind of stand up and support them. And I get every, every chance that I get, I tr every chance I see a cop, I try to tell him, Hey, I appreciate what you do. Not everybody hates you. I know you got a rough job and uh, you know, I try to spread out that hate a little bit with some love. <laughs> You know, I think that's one of the best ways to do it. So if somebody wants to help, what's the best way for them to to help out? If they if they feel led to go out and help you guys, what, what can they do? Well, the number one thing and the best way to get involved is to become a member of, of Spirit of Blue. We have an individual membership program. You can go join uh, for as low as $30 a year and be a part of our community, giving back, helping officers stay safe. Um, there's a ton of people out there who are watching the news, kind of seeing the trends and they're like, Hey, this isn't okay, but I also don't know what to go do. Yeah. And I would say I could give you five or 10 suggestions of things to go do. One of those that would make a great impact and would actually save lives is becoming a spirit of blue member. So that's a great thing. And then secondly, if you are an officer or a deputy who is on the job or you're a family member of one and you worry about your officer, um, if they have safety needs that aren't being met, we definitely want to know about it and we want to take in an application so that we can consider them for a future grant. Excellent. 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 Well, it was excellent being able to talk to you and uh, learn a little bit about this. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your time and uh, please let me know if you need any more help. I hope all of uh, everybody that's watching this goes out and does something. If nothing else, see a cop, tell them that you love them, tell them that uh, they're not alone and that they do have support. So, Thank you very much, Mr. Smith, for uh, taking the time to talk with us this morning. Thank and, you, Brian. Yes, sir. All right. And I'll see you guys in the next one.